that God has brought us into a season, okay, in our local assembly, and I'm excited about it. And I just want to share some things that God has put in my heart, okay, over a, over a period of time. And uh, I do believe that God has someone here that God wants to shift and God wants to change. I want to speak a little bit about taking territories. I want to speak about ter taking territories. And one of my, I, I learn a lot. I'm a lifelong learner. I learn, I have a lot of mentors. I have a lot of people that I learn from, okay? And I, I'm always very excited to say that one of my mentors is a man called Sam Chen. And he began to speak something, and I want to just, let me use the word, I want to steal a phrase from what he said. He talked about moving from the safe zone to the brave zone. From the safe zone to the brave zone. And what's a safe zone? You know that. The safe zone is where you are most comfortable. But where you actually make impact and you actually wield influence is when you move to the brave zone. God took Abraham from the safe zone, leave your father, your mother, your kindred, places you are comfortable, people you knew, you grew up with, and go to a land that I will show you. And many people read that scripture and they don't know what it cost Abraham. Okay, but God has to move. If you are going to be that man or that woman that will be relevant and that will be impactful and that will change your world and leave, okay, something on the footprint of time, you have to be willing to make that transition, to move from that which is your safe zone to the brave zone. Even as a local assembly, I can tell you that we cannot settle. Amen. I wish I could tell you that now that we have this beautiful, powerful infrastructure, beautiful building, amen, amen, hallelujah. I wish I could tell you that we said, but we cannot settle because we have to keep moving from that which is a safe zone. And I can say to you right now, this place is a safe zone for us. But we have to be willing and have the right conversations to move into, this, into the brave zone. That is how to finish. Praise the Lord. And I just want to share one or two things, okay, with you from some icons of the scripture, okay? And I'll be speaking extensively on the life of David today because uh, when you're thinking about taking territories, I mean, David is very iconic in many ways, in very many ways that you know. Okay, now, God wants us to do something, and I want to say this to you. God is putting that talent to you that you need to plow on that down there are grounds in your life or things that you're supposed to be doing that you have not done we call them unplowed grounds and the scripture says it's time for you to break your fallow ground okay it's time for you to plow the unplowed ground so yeah you have plowed some place some parts of your life and you have had some accomplishments some areas but there are some areas where you still are left or you have left fallow god wants you to break them god wants you to break them can i help can I, can you, you know what I'm saying? Every one of us, God is saying, you need to have the right conversation with yourself or with your organization. I speak not only to individuals today, but I speak also to corporates. I speak to families. I speak to friends. I speak to associations. It's important for you to have some right conversation with yourself in this new season. We have to move. Amen. Hallelujah. We have to keep moving until we appear before God in Zion. There is a place called Zion, amen. Um, I mean, accomplishments are good that we have made, good things that we have accomplished, but that's not a risk to it, okay? That's why you need to be stronger, you need to be healthy, and you need to make sure that you do whatever it is in your power to do to make sure you have the capacity to enter your Zion. What do I mean by that? Like I said to you, David will be very iconic in this conversation. Let me throw something to you, Lala, because I realize that when we have interaction around questions and answers, it may help a little bit. David became king and um, after Saul died, the Bible says, you, many of you know his transition, when he was in the cave of Adullam, where he was a fugitive, and then the people came to him, they became mighty men, and then he ascended to become king in a place called Hebron. Now, Hebron is very significant, okay, in the life of the Israelites. I'll probably be able to tell you a bit of some geography or some history about the people of Israel and the land and their attachment to the land and what the land does and speaks about concept of the scripture all right so he became king in Hebron and scripture says he reigned in Hebron for seven years and where everybody will expect now you need to understand this in perspective a, uh, sorry David was from the tribe of Judah okay you get it I want, I want you to understand this amen Saul his producer was from the tribe of Benjamin Hebron 
is in the territory or within the territory of Judah. So it was okay for if, 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 if um, David became king in Hebron, that's, that's home. That's a place where he knew. That's the place where he would win his territory. Okay. And so he could do great ministry and do great things there for seven years and be king and, 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 and stretch out and do a lot of things from that place. Apart from the fact that Hebron was a very prominent, rich, resourceful city. It was, Hebron is such a rich place and such a powerful place, okay, even geographically speaking, very strategic, that it produced some of the best agricultural resources because it's also one of the very few places that you have rain in Israel. I want you to follow me. So if David became king over Hebron, which he did, and he stayed there for seven years, that means that he had resources. That means he has capacities. That means he had opportunities. He was already at home. He had become king over the most probably the most prosperous city of his day called Hebron. But why would David be speaking to himself and saying, I need to take Zion? Because what we call Zion today, Jerusalem, okay, so to speak, was not from the tribe of Judah. He was in another part of the tribe. Okay, so Saul was the tribe of Benjamin. And Saul stayed put in the territory of Benjamin, a place called Gibeah of Saul. And that's where he became king, that's where he ruled, and it was okay. He was successful, he did a bit he could do, and he, he died. And they buried him in the Gibeah, in the place of his fathers, which was okay. Now, when David came, became king after Saul, why would David be aspiring to leave the prosperous, promising, strategic, rich city of Hebron to go to conquer a place called Jebus in the tribe of uh, Ephraim, in the tribe of Benjamin, where Saul was? Something, something must be wrong with this king. Well, listen, you have to have that time where you ask yourself, what do I want? Do I want comfort or do I want impact? Do I want to be on the safe place or do I want to brave the hordes? And David had that conversation with himself. And I want to say this to you, you have to have the right conversation with yourself. And if you decide, to play your game at the safe zone, at the comfort zone, that's fine. You just be like Saul, and that's fine. But if you decide to move yourself, like David did, move his headquarters from the prosperous city of Hebron, and they tell me that Hebron produced some of the best grapes even till today. Okay? So it was a prosperous city. Why will he go to a place? Why? What was driving him? I want the word of God to speak to us today. And it's important for me to build something on this because I like to build that's where, that's where my grace works. If you look at the book of Judges, the scripture says, when the people of Israel entered into the land of promise, which God spoke to Abraham, you know, remember that promise? I'm going to give you the land of Canaan. The scripture says that when they eventually crossed over and took over the land, they began to share the land among themselves. The different tribes chose that land. And there is a particular incident in the book of Judges, and I want us to go there, the book of Judges. Hallelujah. The book of Judges, chapter 1, verse, verse 19 to 21. I want to read just two scriptures, and then I will get us to, to, to think. I just want you to think. I want to challenge you to think. I want to challenge you to answer some really important questions in your life right now. Okay. All right. So the Bible says here, the book of Judges chapter 1 verse 19 to 21, it says, The Lord was with the men of Judah, and they took possession of the hill country. Now when the Bible talks about the hill country, maybe I shouldn't even say that because that may take a bit of time. We don't need those information. But the Bible says they took a hill country. In the, <laughs> and, but they were unable to drive the people from the plains because they had chariots fitted with iron so there were some restrictions 
they met with some restraint. Now, in life, or as you seek to move into the next phase, or you brave the horse and go from the safe zone to the brave zone, you have to know that one of the things that comes with it is resistance. You're going to be resisted. That's, that's where many people get weary and get tired or begin to say, maybe God doesn't want me to do this. Now, the fact that God gave you the land of promise, even for 500 years to your forefathers, doesn't mean that the moment you step out to take that territory, you will not be resisted by hordes of darkness. Now, when you are resisted in any area of life, it does not mean that God is not there with you. Rather, what it means that God wants to build you to be a territory taker. Somebody listen to what I'm saying. Somebody listen to what I'm saying. So even though God gave them the land, you, I will expect that it will be a breeze to take over any place. But no, the scripture says, the Lord was with the men of Judah. <laughs> they took possession. God was with them. God's presence was with them. And they actually took places. But a time came, they couldn't take some places. Look at the next verse with me. Let's run a little bit. Verse 20. The scripture says, in verse 20, go, give, give it to me please, very quickly. It says, as Moses had promised, Abram was given to Caleb, all right, who drove from the three, then from me, the three sons of Anna. Give me the, the next the last scripture. The Benjamites, listen to this, because when you are reading scripture, you need to understand it. The Benjamites, what did I tell you about Benjamites? I said, Saul was a, from the tribe of Benjamin. And Jacob, sorry, David was from the tribe of what? Huh? All right, so Caleb was David's uncle in the very land. And they took territories, but they had something they couldn't take. Now, the Bible says on the other side, the people of Benjamin, the Bible says, however, they did not drive out the Jebus. I want you to underline the Jebus because I'm going somewhere there. They could not drive out the Jebusites who are living in Jerusalem. Another word for Jerusalem was Jebus. The land of Jerusalem that you call Je was known by the Jebusites. They were the owners. They were Canaanites. They were unbelieving Gentiles. And now God had given the land to Abraham. And now by extension and by fulfilling a prophecy, the people, his grandchildren were not going to take, and they were resisted. And the Benjamites could not drive out the people of Jebus. That means that they were stuck with them and they have to live and do business and coexist and co locate with these Gentiles, with their religion, with their bear, with their false gods, and with, with, with their cultures. And they couldn't resist and they couldn't push them out. And that was the situation of things. I think the Bible says somewhere, look, I think the last verse of scripture, it says, To this day, the Jebusites live there with the Benjamites. To this day. But hey, that was as a time of judges. This day, they don't live there anymore because David drove them out. And we want to look at how did David take this territory that the forefathers of the Benjamites couldn't take. That Saul, as mighty as he was, and don't forget, Saul was called of God, was ordained by God, just like David was. But why couldn't he? There were some things that were significant about the life of David. And... Um, I want you to understand it. And I, and I believe the Lord that God has a word for someone. God is speaking to someone today who sat down on their miracles, their testimonies, their good, their, their prosperity, their good successes, their good marriage, their good jobs, their beautiful houses, their great ministry. Whatever it is that you have sat down on and you felt to yourself, I have tried. One of the worst things you can ever say to yourself is come to a moment where you say, I have done well with myself. I have tried. In the spirit, you'll never stop. Kingdom takers, territory takers, and that's who you are. They never make those statements and say, I think we are all right now. You're never all right. And I'll show you the reason. Because there are things that God wants to do. Prosperity or increases or blessing that God gives to you is not for food. It's not for bread and butter. There's just so much you, can, you need to eat after a while. There's, there's just so much, you can, so much you can wear after a while. But there are influence. God wants to be an influence shaper. 
God wants you to be a territory taker. That's why he gives you the resources of the spirit. Every house, every land, every family, every good family, every great children, every great career, every beautiful life, every amazing ministry, it's a reason. Every location, every location is for a purpose. And it's important for you to understand that because if you do not understand that, you will live a life that is ordinary and die, leaving no impact. So this was what happened. So two men decided something, I'm not going to live like my father's. I'm going to push a little bit. Someone say push a little bit. Come on, someone say push a little bit. Come on, someone say push a little bit. So I want to say to you, you need to push a little bit from your safe zone to your brave zone. There's a place, okay, in the brave zone where you need to actually confront and hit your head against the wall. So let's go to the book of First Chronicles. The Bible in the book of First Chronicles gave us a little bit of understanding of how, how David took, okay, that land, okay, that even Saul couldn't take. Are you there with me? Let's take this journey together. Praise the Lord. How? And that's very powerful because, like I said to you, this city, let me say something about, about, um, about so I've told you about Hebron. Jerusalem or Jabus was also a strategic city because one of their, one of their appeals that I may have for, 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 for David was the location of Jerusalem. Now, for those of you who understand in scripture, you'll understand they talk about the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom were the Israelites, the southern kingdom were the people of Judah. All right, the two tribes, okay, were the southern kingdom. In the southern kingdom, it's always very hard to have rain. The south is the place where you have the rocky and the wilderness and the desert places. What you did if you were in the south, okay, was you were a shepherd. That's why David was a shepherd boy. Because the only thing you could do in the south land of Israel, okay, was because the land was not good for agriculture. It was harried land. It was rocky ground. And that's why the only thing you could do was to be a shepherd, to rear animals. That's why David was a shepherd. Now, if you lived in the northern kingdom, which is the real Israel, okay, you had rain. And so because they had, you had rain, you could grow crops. It was always a beautiful place. Now, when David was making the decision, David was saying to himself, I need to move. I need to move to the place of more influence. I need to be the place of more resource. I need to move to the place of, because Jerusalem also, and you need to listen to this because, and I know when I jump into this, you understand it. Jerusalem was such a strategic place that it was like the middle of the place, like the equator, where transactions, businesses, and influence, politics, economics, trade, alliances, commerces, and, 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 and trade routes went, went through. Very small city, but very strategic. Very strategic, and so David said, I think I need to go for that. Now, let me make you understand something how strategic Jerusalem was. Because Jesus, when he was born, scripture says he was born in the Bethlehem of Judah, just like where both David was born. But when Jesus came to a point, the Lord and Master, when he came to the point where he was going to give himself for the sins of the world and pay the price and hang on the cross and redeem the whole world, the scripture says he made a journey. From Bethlehem to Galilee, from Galilee, he went to Jerusalem because that was that strategic place. So why would David move to Jerusalem? Why would Jesus move to Jerusalem? Why would anyone, I mean, that's one of the reasons why people say that even though was a crazy guy, but Trump was a prophetic guy. Because he moved the headquarters of Israel from wherever he was to Jerusalem. If that was the only thing he did, he was making a statement. Now listen to this. So David was saying to himself, there is a place I can see in the horizon. There is a territory that I need to take. It's strategic, politically, economically, socially, resource-wise. No one has taken it. From the days of my forefathers, it belonged to the Jebusites. It's the only place out of many that they could not drive out the Canaanites. See, when we read the scripture, we think that the people of Israel drove out all the Canaanites. No! There were some places they could not attempt. They could not break through. 
But praise God, David was saying to us, you can break through. In spite of enemy attack, in spite of opposition, in spite of resistance from demonic systems, you can break through. Hallelujah. And that's what God is saying to everyone here today. We can break through. I said we can break through. I said we can break through. People will say things like, well, this is Africa. Because you, don't, you can't break through in Nigeria. But it's a lie. Because every generation has their, whatever it is, that resists them. We are in the case of, Bible says, Bible say, the lame and the blind resisted him. Spirit of darkness, structures. Let me, let, let's go to scripture. So in the book of First, Chron First Chronicles, let me, let, let, let me just read it to you. The book of First Chronicles chapter 11 from verse 1 to 9, very quickly. I've given you enough background to understand. So, you, so when, we are, when we are discussing this, you understand. First Chronicles 11, verse 1 to 4. The Bible says, all Israel came together to David at Hebron. Now he had become king at Hebron. And said, we are your own flesh and we are your own blood. So they came and they made covenant with him. Now, in the past, even while Saul was king, you were the one who led Israel on military campaign. They were saying, we have noticed something about you, something supernatural, something super ordinary. And I want to say that there are people in this room today who have some supernatural, extraordinary graces upon their lives. It's wanting to have the potential. It's another thing to pay the price. And the Bible says, the people acknowledge, all of them said, we we'll always know that there's something about you. I want to say to someone here this morning, there is something about you. There's always been something about you that can take territories. And let me say this, I believe in you. The people of Israel said, we believe in you, that you can take this. And so the scripture says, and the Lord your God said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel. Give me the next verse quickly, let's roll this. Okay. And you will become their ruler. And he, did, and he did. Okay, by this time he had become their ruler. Now king, go on please. Next one. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron. Next verse. He made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. As the Lord had promised through Samuel. Remember Samuel? Okay. David and all the Israelites marched to Jerusalem. That is Jabus. The Jebusites who live there said to David, You will not get in here. Your forefathers tried it, they failed. Go and ask them. <laughs> and there are things that your forefathers attempted and failed. There are things that people who are smarter than you, people who believe that they were better than you, or whatever it is, attempted and failed. But you don't have to fail. You can break through. What did I say? I said, you can break through. So the people said to him, we have a history. We've never been conquered. Your forefathers tried it. They couldn't do it. And we are going to resist you. Scripture says this, and David captured the fortress of Zion. Now that's a very important word. Because right now it's no longer being described as a city. It's now described as a fortress. And so we have to be, we have to be a fortress church. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Somebody's listening to me here. Very few people are processing this. You need to understand that God wants you to be a fortress. God wants to take a territory that belongs to the devil and turn it into a fortress of you and your God. I can't hear amen. You're too quiet for me. There is, there is a fortress capacity that is waiting for you to achieve and to receive. There is a territory, there is a kingdom that you can receive, that you need to receive for, for us, for your family, for the church, and for the nation. I, anybody listen to me? So the scripture says, David captured the fortress, which is the city of David. Now, so David, <laughs> he didn't used to be, what was it called? Jebus. Is that right? But by the time we are ready, it has become a fortress. And it has become city of David. Is that correct? God, you need to come to a point whereby you have your stamp on some, on some dimensions of life. Are you get what I'm saying? You need to come, to a, you need to come from nowhere and, and attack a Jebus system. And I'm going to speak to you a little bit about what that means. Okay. 
how you attack it and you turn it and you put and you rechristen it so it's no longer called the city of Jabus, it's now called the city of, of David. Hey, anybody here? And that is what the Lord is giving as a challenge to his church today. And say, my people have been too slack and uncomfortable. I, I, I get very angry when I see people talk about, well, I think I'm all right now. Okay, I didn't have a job and I now have a job. Okay, I didn't have a wife. I have a wife now. No, I didn't have a, I have a I have kids now, and so I'm, 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 I'm okay. So we don't push anymore. We don't pray anymore. We don't, we don't seek God anymore. We don't, we don't push for God's kingdom anymore. We even come to church once in a while, like once a month. You know what I've said? That they said that the regular church attendance right now is now once a month. If you came to church once a month, you're a regular attender. How I many of you just came here in the last four weeks? This is, this is the first time you're coming. That's regular now. That, they, are, they are defining. Imagine what God releases every week as we gather together. Is it the power of the worship where God speaks to your heart and heals you? Or is it the anointing of the word that are just, all right, stuff that you, which of it do you want to throw away? Or is it the fellowship of the brethren where you get encouraged and strengthened? Which of it don't you need in your life? And why will you come to a point where the devil, the devil tells you, you are okay now. And you, you went to church when you were broke, when you were poor. You went to church when you were a single person. You, you, you need church. You need prayer when baby has not rested. Who told you that lie? You never settle. Because the grace of God that broke poverty over your life wants to make you a kingdom taker. And that's how you ought to think. Hallelujah. That's how, so every day my frustration, my greatest frustration right there is, Lord, what's next for us to push? Four years ago, we saw this building. We did the architectural design. We said, let's do it. Now, Lord, it's done. Lord, what's next? What's next? And everywhere I go, people say, well, wow, you, I love your building. Wow, you are, you are this. I say, well, forget about that. We've, we've moved on. Because you have to keep leaving the safe zone into the brave zone. Anybody hear what I'm talking about? What did I say? What did I say? Give me back a feedback. Give me a feedback. Give me a feedback. Give me a feedback. What did I say? What did I say? Now say to myself, say to yourself, what are you supposed to do? So I ask the question right now. Where do you feel safest? God says, break the fallow ground. What do you, what, you know, and we all come to a point where we feel that, what did you try? Ah, uh, my forefathers, what did they have? I have tried. That is never a statement that is uttered by a kingdom person. There always is Zion to take. There is always something more in God to get into. You gotta be you gotta be pressing in, you gotta be curious, you gotta be hungry. That's what David was. David was hungry, like in football. They say he was hungry for goals. You always knew guys who are hungry for goals. If they scored one goal, they never celebrate as much. They celebrate, but they say, Well, I want to I want to score three. I want, I want to have a brace, or I want to have what did they call that three goals? I don't know what it is. Huh? I had trick. You, it's called a, a one, one goal. Everybody say, wow, that's my guy. He said, no, that's not my nation. I want to score three. And then he scores two. They say, it's a brace. He said, no, I don't want a brace. I want a hat trick. And this, if ordinary footballers who are playing for entertainment will be that hungry, how much more you that has a lot that God wants you to do to change narratives in several sectors of human and evil? There are sectors like economics that God wants to raise you to change. Sectors like politics. Sectors like media. And I, 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 I attended a, a media program yesterday with some, some of you guys here. And I'm already thinking, how can, we, how can we get to use movies to preach? We're already thinking that I have some of you, some of you they know themselves, bring them into, into, that, into that conference just yesterday. And when I left that meeting, it was a, it's supposed to be a secular conference of unbelievers. But when I left that meeting, I began to ask myself the question, what can we do to impact that space? And we will do it in the name of the Lord. 
It will be a brave zone. We have never done it before. It may look hard for us to do, but we will do it. I said we will do it. Because it needs to be done. It has to be done. It must be done. Hallelujah. And we are going to set in place systems to make it happen. Because it's high time that the church rose up okay, and governed the territories of Edom. I'm speaking kingdom. I'm, th- I'm speaking to people who are, who, who are stretching their heart for God. Amen. So the scripture says, let's read this through. So David turned it around and it became the city of David. Let's go on. on. David had said, whoever leads the attack on the Jebusites will become commander-in-chief. He gave an offer. Say, this is so important to me. This is such a critical project to me that I am willing to give the best of offer to anyone who will brace the heart, who will go on the brave zone with me. And the scripture says, go on please. Then Job, son of Zeruiah, went up first. I am hoping that somebody here this morning will take the challenge. At least one person. If you're that person, put your hands up. And say, I'm going into the place of braveness. I'm going to begin to ask myself and be hard on myself right now and say, there are some things I need to do different. Different from how to make money and making money. And after, I, I, I want to leave an impact. Today we're talking about Jerusalem. Today we're talking about Zion. Today we're talking about a lot of things about David because this happened. So one of the guys, when he gave the offer, one of the guys said, I am willing to go. And he went. The Bible says, Job went up first. And so he received the command. Next verse. I'm going to, I think, verse 9. Next verse says, Then David took up residence in the fortress. God desires people who will go into the brave zone and make it their residence. Don't forget, it was not his father's land. It wasn't a place of his comfort. It was a different territory that is in the land of another tribe called Benjamin. But they could not take that land, so they abandoned it. There are going to be dimensions of life that people will feel is too hard to accomplish that they have abandoned, that God wants to get in there and take it over. I don't know your space. I don't know your sector. I don't know where God has called you. I don't know. And I, I, just, I just told you one of mine. It looks like Kulian. It looks impossible. It looks like we don't even have the resources or whatever it is. But if we make up our mind that we are going to make that stronghold of Jabez a fortress of God, we will do it. And I say that to everyone here. Whenever you make up your mind, the moment you, you, you agree with yourself and say, I am going forward. I am going forward. The moment you receive that and you speak to yourself and you have the right conversation and you get the right people involved and you have the right discussions and you move and you put in place a system. Listen to this. The scripture says, so David took it, became a fortress. And so it was called the city of David. He built the city around it from terrace to the surrounding walls. Verse 9. Why Joab rested, restored the rest of whatever it is. It says, and David became more and more powerful because the Lord, now that's powerful. David became more and more powerful. You get more powerful when you use what God has given to you, when you don't settle. That's the beautiful thing about this thing. Power is given to people who use power. You want to be more powerful? You want to be more successful? You want to be more impactful? You got to use what God has given to you. So David kept pushing. There's somewhere, I, I, and I'll close with it. And you'll see that in the book of 2 Samuel, I, 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 I think 2 Samuel 5. The scripture describes how David took that place. It says, whoever will take the water course. Listen to me. I, I, I said something to you earlier on. I said there are distributions in the land. The north, you have rain. The south, you have drought. Now, right in a place where Bible is talking about here, it's a city where there was not enough water. You get it? And so they had what they need water. So they have a water system. They have a system because water is life. Water is very important. If, because everything about, is about water. You get it? If you have water, you have wealth. If you have well, that's why. There are water, you have rain water, you have well, you have spring water. Okay? Water was life. David understood the place of water because where he came from in the Negev, it's called the Negev, the southern part. It's a place of drought. It's a place of wilderness. There is no water. So David understand one of the reasons why he also took that nation was he understand that if I can push 
and I can take over this city that has a water system, an irrigation system, a resource that I need, then I will have entered there. And that's what he did. And the scripture says, they went through the water course. What does that mean? It means there are systems in the world that have been established over a period of time that you need to take. And I saw to you earlier on, there's something called, we call the, the seven mandates of human influence. Some, one is politics, one is economics, another one is media, another one is family, another one is, is religion, another one is entertainment, another one is media. Some of you actually right now, you ought to be having conversation. Listen to me. I want you to listen to me if you're if you here. If you're a young person or you're a parent of young people, some of you ought to be asking your children and be channeling them to developing applications that will determine or direct how the world of technology is described. And bring, everybody brings resources out of their culture and out of their value system. So if you are a church man, a church woman, you should be having some conversation with your sons and your daughters and be channeling them in a particular direction, paying their way through these courses, doing stuff, having interaction with them and making intentional investments because what you want to do, you want to take over the water system. This, the world is designed in form of systems. The people who own systems are the ones who control everything. Whether it's economy of Nigeria, it's in the, that economic system is in the hands of some people, about five guys that control the economy of Nigeria. They're going to just one out of the five. That's Fuad, the one of Bua Group, and a lot of other guys like that. Okay, those guys have sat on the economic system. There are people who have sat on the political... I was in a place, uh, I, I was listening to a chat by some guys in the Senate or whatever it is, and I said to myself, these are the guys in whose hand Nigeria's politics is. And they were talking and they were talking trash and, they were, and, they, and I said to myself, oh my goodness, these are the guys. Because they have been in that system for 30 something years. Those guys are the owners of Nigeria's political system. You can't change it. Systems are owned by people. And controlled by people. And that's why when you church, when church talks a lot after a period of time, you get tired because there are people controlling that system. One of the things you can do, you can pray that God will kill them. And but you also have to raise people who will take over them. Because that system will be handed over to their children too. That's the way it works. That's why nations fail. It's system, economic system. There are family systems. Farm, family value systems. That has to be impacted by you. That's why a ministry like couples break first. Family today. You are attacking a culture. And you are trying. Hey, for me, you understand this? You, that's what it is. You are trying to change the narrative. To overthrow the Jebusites. And bring the fortress of God. And there will be resistance in very many ways. But you have to stay connected, stay through, and like young people say, pin there. You have to pin. I'm not saying this, whatever it is God has called you to do, you don't run. You are going to be, the Jebusites will resist you. The lame and the blind will say, you can't get in here. Your forefathers tried, they did not make it. But I'm going to beat my chance and say, I'm not my forefathers. I'm David. I'm David. Are you, are you understand this? I am a territory taker. And the Bible says, he took over the water course. The moment he took over the water course, he won the war. You need to locate the system. So people here, need to, one of the reasons we are doing a lot on the media, I expect that one of our media guys will rise up and be a media mongo and leave this place and go and start a radio, TV station, radio station, editing suite, some stuff, whatever it is. Listen to me. If you are working in the media of the Capstone Church, your assignment is not just to project on the screen. You are being trained. We are giving you the tools. We are investing in IMAX and whatever so that we can train your hand to war so that when you get out of that place, you can say, let's change the narrative. Let's save some territories. That's the only way church is not religion. Anything outside that, is religion. 
When you come to the meeting like this and you hear what you ask yourself question, what's my sector? I'm an entertainer. I'm an artist. How do I change the narrative? There were a lot of stuff that are in the artist world. I, as I sat in that room yesterday on that, me, on, that, on that movie training, it was a movie festival, and I was hearing that a young woman was asking and saying, I want, <laughs> I want to, I want to start a, a film festival for horror movies. Oh yeah, and she will do it. I wish I can hear people in the church say, we want to start a film festival for kingdom movies where we will showcase value statements where we'll bring out movies out of what pastor for me has preached in family where we'll bring out movies out of what people have taught on finances where we'll bring out movies out of what people have taught about politics and influence and integrity and whatever it is we teach it as a bible study in church we never practice it and that's why the world is still the way it is I expect that somebody will say, this is wrong. We need to change the way Nigeria receives money. I hear that Nigeria, you can't receive money in Nigeria by dollars. You can't even get, and we have our friends who came to Nigeria from America who tried to make transactions in dollars. And every shop we went, every mall we went, the best of the malls in this city, they said we do not take dollar cards. So there has to be someone who will get angry in the church and say, this must make me angry to change the narrative. There has to be somebody in government who says, I walk with government and I see them. These guys are slurs. These guys are terrible guys or whatever it is. I need to ask myself, are there other guys I can walk with? Is there a job that can stand with me? And then we can begin to, by excellence and by integrity, knock off these guys so that we can take over and change the narrative of politics and governance. And there are people in this room listening to me right now who God has sent. God is sending to different places. What God has done is God has sent me to the mountain of religion to bring forth resources, stuff like this, so that I can challenge you and school you and redirect you. That's why I don't do things that churches do, which is religious. I do not do it. I don't believe in religion. I believe this book is not a religious book. It's a book of impact. A David must rise up in this place and take the fortress. I can't hear you. You're too quiet for me. You're too quiet for me. A David must rise up in this place and ask when he gets home, what did pastor just preach? What does it mean for me as an entrepreneur? What does it mean for me as a man raising young children, young kids? What does it mean to me, for me as, an, as, 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 a, as a job applicant? Lord, if you give me that job, I promise you, I'll get there first before everybody. I will be working so, such ethics that in three years, they will promote me and make me the PA to the MD. When I become the PA to the MD, I'll be able to get him into the, into the word of God because it's messed up God and I need to square his head up. People need to start thinking like that. You don't have to be the CEO to win influence. Daniel was not CEO. Joseph was not CEO. Esther was not CEO. Just ordinary guys. But who knew their God? And who understood that Jebus has to come down and that the fortress, fortress of God has to be built. Is anybody in this room this morning who wants to move in that realm? Raise your hands up. And say, Father, speak to me. Speak to me. Speak to me. And we, 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 the only way we can salvage the Christian church is if the world sees us like this. Then they will begin to respect our God. Then they begin to change their policy about churches. Because they will see that it's a church boy like Daniel that saved their economy. Their politics. It's a church boy like Joseph that saved their economy. Until church boys and church girls begin to rise up and take, make influence in those territories, the world will not take it. That world is a very cowardly world. Trust me. They can boast all they want. They are living on credit. Do not join them. Do not join them. Because at the end of the day, they commit suicide. They get tired. They do a manner of things. They're weary and they're frustrated. You are of God. He is yours and you are his. Is that not what the worship team said? He is yours and you are his. Now, begin to listen to his voice. Lord, what do you want me to do in this place? Why did you bring me here? 
why did you give me this job why do you bring me into this neighborhood you look to your right you look to your left you look to the front you look behind you you say who are my neighbors why did you plant me here lord why did you bring our church to this place why did you pin us here so so when you have so don't just go and say well i got a job i'm changing job again you know no 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 you ask first of that question why did god bring me here and then once you are able to say well god brought me here for this reason to take over this place then you now ask him lord for how long and he tells you two years so i tells you i'll tell you when i'm ready and when he's ready he will tell you now move and once you move you know okay now god i've heard the marching order of my chief of staff my commander in chief you see you need to live like that praise the name of the lord you need to know that you have no say in how you move you move because your commander in chief has ordered you to move father we honor you today receive grace and say father god i receive boldness where well, we've been talking a lot about faith and boldness and and miracles i do believe that god wants to actually create some miracles in your life and make you see some miracles opportunities many of you are some in some frustration point right now you have you, you feel resistant you feel everything is resisting me i thought they said that if i become a christian if i serve the lord everything will be easy no read the bible again that's a lie lie gospel <laughs> that's a lie lie gospel because in some hardness is where your faith is built and and that but in the midst of the resistance there is grace for you because i won't go on my page you hear know what i said the host of heaven will stand with you and walk with you and that's how we move that's why we build territories i want you to rise to your feet and let's say, let's spend one, one minute in prayer i want to really commit your your seventy and say father god almighty Review to me what is a brave zone for me. Review to me what's a brave zone for me. What's a brave zone? What's a brave zone? Show me. And if you listen well enough, you will hear the voice of the Lord telling you, I've been telling you this, you know, now my son has, to, I've been telling you this for the last two years. So you are too comfortable. And you're not pushing anymore. Nothing should stop you from pushing. Because there's so much you still have to take. And David took the territory. And David attacked the water system. And David changed the system. And it became the city of David. Till today. Till today. Father, we ask you, God Almighty, reveal to us what's the brave zone for us as a church. And I know that people here this morning, you have been frustrated and you don't know the next thing to do. You are in a good place. You are in a very good place. Because now it's going to take you to a place of questioning and asking the Lord and say, Father, I've come to a place where I don't know the next thing to do. Oh, trust me, you will hear the voice of the Lord. He will tell you what to do. But can I ask you, the moment you hear the voice of the Lord, the moment you hear that nudge inside your spirit saying, your next assignment is the land of Jebus. Just go for it. Trust me, all the men that you need, all the influence you need, all the resource you need, I've already provided for you. You just need to take that step. You will see heaven open. And for Father, this morning we want to thank you. Thank you, Father, for the privilege and opportunity to hear your voice. And we receive this. Lift your hands. Say, Father, I receive grace for my next level. I receive grace for my for my for my brave zone. I receive grace for my brave zone. Lord Almighty, I receive faith for my brave zone. Come and pray and say, Father, I receive faith. Many of you are scared. Where will I get the money from? Money is not your problem. Lord, who will help me? That's not your problem. People, money, they follow vision. I'll say that again. People, money, they follow vision. Even unbelievers understand it. That once you have a vision, everything will follow it. There's a book called The Outliers. He said, nature will answer to everything you want to have. Father, we want to thank you. We receive favors. Come on, say with me, Father. I receive favors. I receive peoples. I receive resources to support my faith. Lord, as I move forward, I move in power. I move in boldness. I move into my brave zone. I will never be afraid. 
Now speak and say, I command every resistance to bow. Every resistance, I command you to bow. Sometime I'll be infirmity, they will be trying to attack you. Command you to bow. The devil wanted to kill me. I thank God for I have a Joab. Amen. And I want to celebrate my wife. Praise the name of Jesus. The Holy Ghost said, this guy has so much assignment to do. And so he put in the heart of my wife and said, you need to deliver this guy. I, didn't even, I was busy just chilling. And the devil wanted to kill me. My wife said, hey, talks. There's something I see that you need to take care of. I said, babe, forget. You're always too fastidious about things. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. He said, no. She did not sleep overnight. She picked it. You need a job in your company. Or else I was dead meat. And vision will have died. But I thank God today that I have the right team on my side. I want you to pray and say, Father, give me a right team. Sup- su- Lord, supply me with resources of men and women. Oh, I pray that God will send you your Joab's people. Oh, may God send you people who will not be able to sleep until they have taken care.